everyone, and welcome to this edition of Orion Outreach. We have a very special guest here in the studio today. This is going to be Matt Faulkner. Hi, say hi, Matt. How you doing today? Hi, everybody. I'm doing well today. It's good to be with you. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. We're very honored to have you here in the studio. Matt and his wife, Kristen, who is not able to be here today, have written and illustrated some amazing books that we're going to be talking about. And so without further ado, let's get straight into it. Cool. So Matt, I see two books here. We talked a little bit before the interview, but I want to hear a little bit about what inspired these books and what are they about? Well, first of all, uh, then uh, again, thanks for having me here. It's, of it, this is a lot of fun. Uh, these are both written by my wife, Kristen. Kristen Reminar, and um, she is uh, an author, has uh, been working to be a kids book author for like 20 years. And then uh, about 10 years ago, she got the call that said, yes, we want to buy this, um, this manuscript that you've written called Groundhog's Dilemma, this book here. Right here, okay. Yeah, and uh, it was, um, you know, as you can imagine, a very big deal for her. To Absolutely. Ha you know, have them call up and say, "Hey, Kristen, let's let's p print this," and it was with a, a a kids book publisher called Charles Bridge Publishing. Okay. And uh, they're in, in outside of Boston, and uh, they said uh, uh, part of the reason why this this story came up for Chris was because um, two things. One of them is the it, the story is about friendship, and not only about friendship, but what do we do in order to make our friends happy? Right. And is it okay for me to be me as I am? And what do I have to give up to be with certain people? And is that right? Do I really want to do that? And so Chris is also, she was born on February 2nd. So <laughs> she's always loved the groundhog. So she decided that this was going to be a story about some of groundhog's friends love winter and they want it to be a longer winter. Like the, the hare likes to have her, her winter coat and the bear likes to sleep longer, but some of them don't like winter so much, like the sparrow wants the baseball season to start, and the squirrel is a, a single dad, and he's got three little kits, and they're driving them crazy in the little <laughs> nest, so they want it to end sooner. And um, so Chris uh, you know, decided, okay, I'm gonna make this story all about Groundhog, trying to make some friends happy over here and some here, and then eventually he has to just, just decide, I have to be myself. Right. And I have to um, base my decisions not upon what's going to make other people okay with me being me, but what's going to make me feel like it's okay for me to be me. And it, it's, a, it's just a delight. Uh, you know, I can say that because she's my wife too, but, <laughs> but also it's, it's just um, a, a, a sweet, important story, I think, for you know, whatever age, but certainly the seven to eight year old uh, right, audience. Yeah. But, but also all of us who are, you know, parents reading the story to their kids. It's, um, it's important. And uh, I was happy to make the illustrations for it. So that was one of the other things when they asked Chris, they said, do you think that Matt would be willing to make the illustrations? And she was like, willing? <laughs> So that's amazing. So you were able, so you actually didn't go in knowing that you were necessarily going to illustrate these books. However, it just worked out. So you got to collaborate with your wife. Yeah. And that's amazing that you both share the same passion because, you know, books are something, I think we were talking a little bit um, prior to the interview, Matt, that I remember books from my childhood because that was like, I was learning how to read. I was trying to figure life out myself, navigating through that seven to eight year old girl who was shy, who mm -hmm. didn't know how to make friends necessarily. So having a message like that, but still in a light-hearted way with visuals and things, it's such a powerful tool that stays with you throughout your whole life. So it's really beautiful, and you get to do it with your partner, which makes it, I'm sure, a little bit easier, too, as well. Well, you know, the, yes, it does. It, and just that issue, too, of like um, the books that we have when we're seven or eight-year-olds, year um, they do become like anchors for us, you know? Absolutely. Um, and... Uh, to, to have those as access points, um, they become like little road maps for bumps in the road in our lives, some bigger bumps and smaller ones, but the, you know, just right. the idea of um, to give a child uh, these, you know, access to these every night is a really a tremendous gift. And so, um, you know, any, any picture books. Uh, I've been making picture books since uh, 1985 was my first picture book. So, that was one of the things is that trying to figure out, okay, I, I was pretty sure they were going to offer Chris this contract. Right. But I didn't know that if it was the best thing for Chris to have me illustrate the book or to have another illustrator because this is my, you know, this is my business. Uh, it, it was a big deal 
at the same time, since it's my business, I had to try to figure out what's best for Chris as an author in her business. So we talked about that. Yes, yeah, so you had to have a serious conversation about yeah. it. Absolutely. You but, had to think about things and really, you know, is this the right step to take for these books? It didn't take a long conversation because <laughs> you know, <laughs> That's we a good like, thing, right? They, they pay you more when you both do <laughs> when you both work on it. So uh, yeah, you know, we were like, Yeah, well Matt'll do the, the drawing. So that went over really well. Okay. Um, Chris ended up uh, the first week of um, January in 2016, it was right after when the book came out, we were in Boston giving a, um, a at a big conference, a library conference, American Library Association. Oh, and, wow. And, and Chris was signing books and I was signing them with her. And I, I was going to stay there and go, vi do school visits, um, which is part of the business of being an author and an illustrator. You visit schools around the country. And Chris had a stroke. <gasps> yeah. I am so sorry. Yeah, yeah. And um, so she's been working her way back since then. And um, she was able to um, work through that. It's been eight and a half years now. And to be able to present this story, but it did take this, the second one, uh, Squirrel, Squirrel Needs, Needs a, a Break. break. And uh, yeah, it, it took a while for her to come to a place where she could um, be able to focus, be able to, um, she, she has you know, extreme fatigue at times. Um, and so she's been able to write the story. This one came out earlier this spring. And uh, this one, I'll just say, is about um, Squirrel, who we found out had, has three kids in the earlier book. And mm -hmm. he's a single dad, and he's just losing his <laughs> mind with these three kids. And the, uh, the other animals, uh, hare and groundhog and uh, owl and, and sparrow, they decide, um, maybe we could take care of the kids for a day. I mean, how hard could that be? Mm -hmm. Which is, we learn how hard that could be <laughs> through the there, book. There's a lot of chaos yes, sometimes, yeah, right? Yeah. And then, so while some of them are taking care of the kids, the others are taking a uh, squirrel to like the spa or to yoga or to a baseball game. And so, you know, one of the things too, and for me that's important as an illustrator is can I make imagery that's both um, obviously appealing to the audience, the seven or eight year olds, um, but also appealing to the parents. What's, what's funny? What looks silly in both a slapstick seven year old uh, way, but also <laughs> like a parent can look at it and go, that's really ridiculous. I like that, you know, so. Yeah, I think that that's a powerful thing that you can do too. And as an author illustrator and, you know, working with Kristen, it's so great and you do such a natural job at it, right? When composing these stories together, yeah. but being able to add that wit, to add that, you know, empowering story and the dynamic characters, all those tools are so vital to a story. And so to, to do that all and to kind of see the point of view for each each character and what they're going through and how mm -hmm. they end, you know, come to that solution or come to that resolution at the end. I think that's really great, and I think it's something that the meanings of the stories, even adults, can go back and go, "Yes, this is something that I want my kids to be able to, you know, learn and see how they're going to get through certain obstacles in life." But um, on the other hand, too, as well, that she was able to, you know, go through all those health challenges, which I know um, from my family history as well. It's not easy, and it's not easy always to get back on something even when it's something you love to do mm -hmm. it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of balance as well so the fact that um, you know this new book was able to come out this year super exciting and super inspiring so congratulations to both of you no oh, well, thank you yeah I mean when Chris to me is like a, like a just a tremendous creative warrior because she has really had to work through some severe difficulties um, and to see her just say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna keep on doing this, I'm gonna keep on doing it, I'm gonna keep on, is really another great message. Yes. That um, the real testament is, you know, it's a cliche, but it's not how you fall down, it's how you keep on it's getting how you, back up. Yes, how are you gonna get back up and how are you gonna get through the next step, even if it is challenging at times? Yeah. So that's a beautiful thing. Um, if you don't mind me asking, so the illustrations, I mean, we were talking a little bit about how important visual storytelling is for kids as well, because there right. are kids that are very creative and sometimes I feel like it's hard when you are learning and navigating through school as is to always be able to do everything you love, as in drawing, as in 
and telling your own stories. So how do you think that kids can get involved and how can they have a good support system around them if they do want to follow through with something like illustrating a book or authoring and illustrating a book in the future? Mm -hmm. You know, there are so many school systems now that do employ, uh, first of all, they're bringing us, the authors and illustrators, to the school. So it's, you know, we can be like this actual bridge to the kids. Look, there's a human being who does this. This just didn't pop out of a microwave, done. You know, it's <laughs> like, how did it get done? And so that's what we show them. Here are the sketches. Here's the discussion with the editor. Here are the intermediate sketches. Here's the final art. You don't just make one big piece of art and it's done. You have this whole process. That's one of the things in talking with the kids, too, and teaching at colleges. I, I um, have taught in colleges in the area, also in San Francisco, and, and just this summer in Virginia. Um, a lot of people think that you go right to the finished piece of art, and it's done. No, there's no, this whole No, there's steps. <laughs> oh, my God. So to help people actually work through that, too, is like, okay, no, you're not done yet. We're going to change and revise and change and revise. And you have to get used to that as part of the process. Yes. Um, so... Uh, in order to help a child, one, first and foremost, it would be good, and I just suggest to parents, look into it yourself. Where are the resources for an adult who would want to get into this? And one of the primary ones is called the Society for Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. Society, Society. for Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, SCBWI. Org. And that's an awesome first step to kind of research in, yeah. gather more information so that the parents are able to assist their child yes. and kind of start that process. Because Absolutely. I think it's always the scariest part and probably for parents as well is that first step, taking the leap of faith. And so knowing that they have resources they can navigate, and I'm sure Matt, when you do visit these schools, you are always eager to answer questions yep. and provide any feedback yep. or, you know, hey, maybe go this direction first and foremost. That way you can kind of get a plan going because I know I think that's the hardest part is trying to figure out how am I going to do this, especially if you're not familiar with all the steps because like you said, it's not just a one and done thing. There are several different steps in the transition as you finish something like this. Yeah, you know, we're really moving out of a time too where um, as a culture, we uh, this is just me up in my little soapbox, we, <laughs> we're really invested in uh, letters and numbers. That's yes. how we communicate. Obviously, it makes sense. You need numbers to balance your checkbook. <laughs> to, to write a check, you need letters. <laughs> you know, but um, the, the issue for, for me as I was and, and am a visual storyteller, and I come from that, I get that term from this um, Harvard uh, University, uh, I think he's a doctor now, uh, Howard Gardner. And he developed this thing called Brain Smarts. Okay. which was and said that there's nine different ways for the brain to be smart. And this was a revelatory thing in like the early 90s. Uh, and it, what it started to say to, was to the education system, it's not just about numbers and letters. Mm -hmm. If we deny the fact that children come with, because they also have brain smarts or number smart, letter smart, um, picture smart. Different types of smart. Movement smart. Even uh, they have like... Uh, uh, intuitive smart mm -hmm. you know it's amazing they're acknowledging all of these ways that the brain that for so long it was reading writing and arithmetic and that's it and that was it and and it makes sense but it didn't help because if you're denying access points to certain students who come primarily with a visual storytelling you're gonna shut down the other doors too because they're just gonna feel ignored and abandoned which is how many, that's, that's happened true. to so many of us, right? Mm -hmm. And it, and I'm not, you know, it's, it's, I gotta be careful. I'm not blaming anybody, although it, in a large part it happened to me. I know lots of people who that happened to. And so our, our culture is changing. The idea that 25 years ago, graphic novels were not accepted in libraries, really, the way they are today. They're not just accepted, they're celebrated. The, the, yes. Uh, Book of the Year this year, the National Book of the Year, was a graphic novel by Dan Santek. Isn't that amazing, though, that we're able to get through those different periods of time and there's not as much restriction anymore. Right. There is more, let's support each other in whatever area of life, whatever we want to grow into, whatever career we want to express ourselves in. We are able to see that, and I think that that is so 
empowering, but also I'm glad that we shifted the way things have been because yep. you learn from that and you learn from the past and knowing that there are so many advocates as yourself and your wife that are so supportive of children who may have way different ideas in mind. It's just being more open to taking on those challenges and really overcoming anything that stands in the way of them and their goals. So I And it's I really for the culture that. too, you know, it's mm -hmm. because when we say everybody has different access points to how they're going to receive the world and also give back to the world. Mm -hmm. What we're doing is we're opening up all kinds of doors, doors. of productivity mm -hmm. and creation and transformation to everyone. Yes. Those children are going to bring things that otherwise we would deny them. Yes. So it's a good time. It's, it's a little it's scary to some people. I don't blame them because <laughs> it's we're changing. There's always something that's unknown, right? But yeah. you have to explore it. You can never I always tell myself you can never know too much. So always take on something and always just try to I want to grow every single day no matter if I make a mistake. If I am challenging and I'm like, "Oh, Lexi, I'm not going to be able to do this." It's being able to get through that and having the grit, the attitude, yeah. the focus, refocusing if you have to, but it's all those steps that are needed because at the end of the day I mean, when you think about it, this is life. We only have one life, and we should always live it to, I mean, the fullest yeah. that we can. So being able to do that is one of the most amazing things that I get to witness, too, in, at my age, is seeing how things have shifted from even when I was a little girl. Yeah. When I was a little girl, I never felt like I had necessarily the tools or the resources I needed to explore my creative you know, dreams. I like doing journalism and I love TV and I love all of that. But as a kid, it's usually, you know, it was always kind of frowned upon. And like you said, it's not necessarily, you know, anybody's fault, but it's a cultural shift that yeah. we're more accepting of taking on different courses throughout our And not our just lifetime. accepting, right, but celebrating. Yes. Celebrating, you know, mm -hmm. celebrating these children. I had a friend who grew up in Africa and, and, and there in his culture, um, it's not just a an uh, interesting topic at a you know cocktail party they literally they they actually believe and support the idea that every child is coming to the community with a gift and I love and, e that. and even if it's um, something that makes the community uncomfortable that could mean that it's actually even more important gift yes it's very valuable right it's the most valuable gift right Everyone should be celebrated for no matter what they do. And thank you so much for reinforcing that because that really is empowering to know and that's how it should be. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'm glad that we are learning to celebrate every single victory no matter where we're at in our journey. It's just something that we all need as humans. Yeah. From a young age onward up into an older age, we need that reinforcement, that celebration that, hey, things are going great and we're going to keep celebrating every single goal, desire, dream out there. Yeah. So, yeah. It's empowering. So I wanted to ask you, Matt, I know that we are talking about your new book here and I'm super excited for everyone out there that's going to be watching this and hopefully going to run to the library and say, let me check out both these books. I mm -hmm. want to read them both. But I heard that you said that you're working on another book yeah. coming into next year. It just so happened that they loved the second book. You know, it took seven years for, you know, to work on uh, and they were like, can you do another one? And Chris was like, yeah. So uh, this one is called Owl's Fall Feast Fiasco. And okay. it is about Owl is, um, puts on a big dinner every autumn mm -hmm. and he uh, invites all of the, his friends and he assumes that everybody because of what they look like mm -hmm. are gonna, or, or because of their, their species are going to eat a certain thing, and he goes around and says, "So you oh. want? Do you want to have more uh, nuts and uh, you know to this? Uh, I, I'm not going to tell all the story, but you know, he, <laughs> yes. he goes around to everybody, and they're like, well, actually, I don't really eat that stuff, and I've never eaten it at the fall feast. I eat this stuff, and he's like, oh my god, I don't know what to do. Uh, <laughs> What's the right answer, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and in addition to that, a mysterious, uh, well, not so mysterious in the story, but a a uh, person is coming from across the world, a, uh, uh, what do they call them, uh, owl and, uh, what are the, oh, duck-billed duck platypus Okay. is going to come visit for the dinner. So they're trying to figure out what they're going to feed the duck-billed platypus. So um, this has been interesting. Uh, it's, to me, it's about assumptions. 
assumptions. What yes. we make about what we assume about other people can get us into trouble with other people. Yes, if we always assume the same stereotypes. Yes. That's a problem. We have to think outside of a stereotype in order to get through life and accept people as they are. And but to me too, this is about a depth mm -hmm. in the stories that Chris writes. Not only in terms of she presents really interesting multifaceted characters who have stories that we don't really learn all of their stories, right? They, you don't need to know them to know, uh, get the story in a picture book, uh, but also in the, the nuance of the way she writes the story, yes, there is this deeper sort of message about, about acceptance and um, again, celebrating, not just acceptance. Mm -hmm. But also, it's not just, you know, we're not just look, okay, w what are we gonna teach? But it's, can we have some fun doing this? Absolutely. So, you know, she sets up these really silly, interesting, funny, quirky scenarios, too, that are just, you know, make, make me guffaw. <laughs> <You> know? <laughs> and uh, so that's delightful, you know, and that's what I want to celebrate in the book, too, is to bring those moments, the, this is important, but not to hit kids over the head yeah. with the message. Because from my experience, too, in, in picture books, kids uh, can, their radar goes up pretty quick when they're like, oh, this is another one of those books where they're trying to make me learn something. Yes, you know, it, it so. can push them away sometimes. So mm -hmm. being able to find a happy medium is very important for these books. Yes. So if you don't mind me asking, Matt, what is your process like when actually illustrating? So I'm sure you go through drafts and you have different ideas that are probably circling throughout your brain because I feel like when it comes to illustrating, there's, so, there's no right answer, right? You can really just go however far you want into the story and say, okay, what am I going to do? How am I visually going to support the story, the words? And how do I do it in a unique way that kids, like you said, are going to kind of maybe laugh at or say, oh, look at this picture. You know, what is that process like for you? Well, one of the first ones is um, coming to the understanding that when I read a story, a story like uh, Squirrel Needs a Break is presented to me whether my wife wrote it or anybody else, that I have an immediate response. And that um, the input, the story, is being responded to by who? Mm -hmm. Well, by me, but also my creative self. Call it the muse, whatever you want to call it. It is this part inside of me that wants to have fun. And so in a lot of training for doing this kind of work, what can happen is people want us to immediately look outside and say, okay, uh, we're gonna have squirrels in this, I need to look at what squirrels look like. And in my teaching, what I want people first to get in touch with is what their response is. I don't really care what you think about what a squirrel looks like yet. I want to see what, how are you going to tell the story? What other things do you see? Mm -hmm. are, is the squirrel uh, wearing suspenders? And pants. I don't know. It didn't say so in the story, but if you have that image inside of you, can you put that down first? So for me, that's always the most important thing is let the inner um, storyteller, visual storyteller speak. Get those images, no matter how scribbly, out onto the paper, tape, uh, paper mm -hmm. as quickly as you can. Yeah. Because other stuff is going to get into the way and start to even tell you your your perception of this is not really the most important thing. You need to draw this just the way a squirrel is. Right. So I think that it's important to, to answer your question, that is, um, get in touch with what my personal response is first. Get those thumbnail sketches down. Mm -hmm. Then start to do research, start to look up, um, get imagery, start to go out and take pictures of, you know, find some squirrels who sit still for a, a moment and take pictures of them if they'll let me. Uh, and um, the other thing that I do is that, for instance, um, uh, the voice of the characters is important to me. So, uh, for instance, the squirrel, I decided he was, along with Chris, we, like, so who is the person who sounds most like uh, what the squirrel would sound like. And you're like, oh, this has to be like a movie star. Have to, yeah, it's a pensive thing. You have to really think about that, yeah, right? Yeah, and what, what resonates? And so the, I'm gonna say a name, and if you, you know, you'll, I think you may know this uh, artist, uh, Steve Buscemi is the, he's this <laughs> crouchy little guy. And so his voice, <laughs> when I think of the squirrel, 
really, it I think. It aligns uh, with. Yes. Okay. And so I keep an image of him uh, in around me. You know, I have all kinds of different images when I'm doing a book. I keep an image of him. I, uh, what are some of the other um, uh, names? Uh, Rosie O'Donnell was the bear for a while. Okay. Um, Kristen, oh, I forget her last name. She was in the TV show um, The Good Place. Um, the Good Place. Oh, I know who you're talking about. I cannot think yeah, of her blonde, name. Too. Yes, uh, the I blonde. Her, she yeah, yeah, short hair. Yeah. Um, who else? There's a couple other. Oh, Michael Sarah okay. was one of them. He was the groundhog for a he while. He was the oh I was I was gonna ask you that. Yeah, I was like yeah. who's the groundhog? Yeah, because so. I wanna know who uh, you were thinking about for the groundhog. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, these it's important to again, it's like this whole brain activity. How do you, how does sound, how does movement, how does the and this is one of the things I teach my students too, is like get up and move like your characters. Yes. If you don't believe in your characters, why should anybody else? And so you gotta be willing to act look weird. Right. Talk to to your characters. Sculpt your characters, even though you're making them two dimensionally. Make even if you're not that good at sculpting, just go ahead and make it and have that thing up there to actually talk to. Uh, people can say it's weird. That's just part of our job description, <laughs> right? I don't think it's weird. I think it's inspiring. Yeah. Hearing you talk about that process, it actually makes sense to me. When That's I was what we do. when I was younger and I read a good book, I I know this sounds kind of funny to say, but I would do the same thing. I would think about who's an actress I see on a TV show that I watch on a kid's movie, anything like that, or that voice. Whose voice could I see, you know, if this were to be turned into a film? And that helped me understand and comprehend the story. So I don't think that's a bad thing at all, is sometimes you need to take those further steps in to really get involved with your story. Yeah, and it's it's so much of the movement too, you know. Is is the character posture you yeah. know, like this? Or is it like this? These yeah. mean different things because then also as a visual storyteller, we start to get into shape. This is a different kind of shape than this. And, you, and children different. get it right away. Yes. You know, and they'll uh, make a shape and say, that triangle is this person in my story. And, you know, it's really important that we believe them because that leads to them further developing how they express themselves. So whether it's shape or color, that person is a triangle and purple. That's their interpretation, support it 100%. Mm -hmm. And you have no idea where that could take that that child will take that and we have to give them that kind of trust yeah and that faith that they're here to do something really important and cool for us yes so it's so. understanding and having each character have their own attributes yep. that are noticeable they're recognized by who's reading the book whether it be a child or an adult yep. and like you said it, you kind of have to explore that more you're giving the reader that authority to really take the story and, and think about everything, even on a deeper level. I mean, there's so much that goes into it, but I love it because like you said, you're able to make it lighthearted, you're able to make it fun. Yeah. But um, I just love too that the setting, um, lots of the seasons have an impact on these books. Mm -hmm. So it's really kind of tying everything together. And that's what's so inspirational about it too is, um, are you from Michigan? No, I'm originally from, from outside of Boston. Okay, so um, living in Michigan now, did that have some inspiration going into your books and illustrating in oh, certain yeah. components? Since you know, the four seasons, of course, are kind of what everyone talks about when visiting Michigan, at least when I hear um, some people from different parts of the world or even the country. I, you know, we have four seasons in New England too. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And but, so, but they're different. They really are. Uh, you know, this is a different uh, part of the world. Uh, even though it's the same country. Uh, I feel so like it's so different. When it, I was it there, it was so is. different to me. I don't know why. I think it's just because I'm rooted here in Michigan. But you know. I was really tempted to, for like, so doing the, the fall feast fiasco for Owl right now, it's all about the autumn. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm like, oh, I'm going to look up New England uh, fall colors. And I was like, no, I cannot <laughs> because I have tried to look up imagery. Um, I, I have looked up imagery rather than from Michigan because. Mm -hmm. I, it has to be based here to be, and, it, and again, it's another one of those things, oh, come on, Matt, nobody's going to know. No, but I would know. 
And yeah. that makes all the difference. It makes a big difference for yeah. sure, for certain, even as illustrator. And I'm sure Kristen feels the same way when writing these books as well. So Matt, if you don't mind me asking, um, we've got these two amazing books here. We've got Groundhog's Dilemma, we've got Squirrel Needs a Break, and then we have a third book that will be coming out next year. If you don't mind me asking, where can people find more details? I know these books are in the Orient Township Library, but if they want some more details about these books, where can they get that information? Well, I'm going to send everybody to our websites. Um, uh, first of all, Chris's website, KristenReminar.com, and I'm sure they'll probably put up a graphic for that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then also my website is just mattfaulkner.com. Awesome. Both of these have, um, Chris's in particular has uh, links for like stuff that teachers can download and parents for making puppets and coloring and really? so forth. Yeah, so um, wow. I think she has a page too that may have something about the, um, the four seasons with the different clothing that uh, Groundhoggy wears. <laughs> so I know that's I do pictures fascinating. for fascinating. No, that's those are amazing yeah. resources. Yeah, though. she's really those smart. Those are tools so. that um, are very useful in a classroom, even at home too during the summer period. Right? Can always be good to bring those out and use them for you know just keeping all the ideas, everything learned throughout the school year, still fresh in a child's mind. Yeah, yeah. and and um, you know it makes sense too because Chris was the actually prior to the stroke the children's librarian at Lake Orion. That's so, what I heard. That yeah, is yeah. so awesome. Yeah, yeah. I hope she is doing well. And, yeah. you know, thank you so much for coming in here to the studio today and sharing this big component of both of your lives because, yeah. I mean, it's seriously so impactful. And so everyone, you know, check out the Orient Township Library if you want to check these wonderful books out. Again, Matt, it was such a pleasure to have you on the show here again today. Thank you so much. Is there anything else you want to say to wrap up this edition of Orient Outreach today? Um, what is uh, Groundhog? He always says, um, I'll just tell it like it is. And on that note, yeah, you just tell it how it is. That's a great quote to end the show today. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you all for watching.